So the last video was a bit of a doozy. I recognised that there was a lot of content there and it's quite difficult content and also it was quite long to allow me to try and explain that as best that as I could. Um, so this one will hopefully be a bit more, um, a bit shorter and a bit more straightforward. So when we talk about rates of evolution, rates being represented by this fantastic uh, film poster from 1992 um, for the movie Speed, great if you like 90s action movies, we can think about the rates of change in both genomes and morphology. So genomic or phenotypic evolution, those are two words that just mean the same thing. Either way, um, however we're looking at this, historically, Biologists and paleontologists assumed up until relatively recently, say the 1970s or so, that speciation happens gradually, um, new species branch off from their ancestors rather slowly, um, and that evolution occurs in a gradual way. But it's really interesting to think about whether that is true or not. So when it comes to the study of evolution, is it fast? Is it slow? Is it reliably so, or does it change with time? And this also touches upon a number of other questions regarding, for example, the longevity of species. Why do some species appear to last for a long time, whilst others quickly transform? In many instances, why um, do we see um, bursts of speciation and associated with that extinction? And why do those two seem to be correlated? Why does speciation and extinction um, seem to, to occur at high rates in certain parts of the tree of life? Both the molecular clock approach and the fossil record can help us probe questions associated with evolutionary rates, supported by experimental work on model organisms and observational study of living e ecosystems. So I'm not cutting those out, but you know, if we're looking at long time periods, then fossil record and molecular clocks are particularly useful. So let's meet an example which can illustrate the intersection of the study of rates of evolution with the really important evolutionary events. And that event is the Cambrian explosion. So remember the Cambrian explosion that ha happened 542 million years ago where modern animal phyla appear in a really short time period. And there's this ongoing debate really regarding whether this was an artifact of the fossil record it represents so suddenly all of these organisms are actually just being preserved as fossils or was it a real event one where actually these organisms evolved really rapidly from, um, from their ancestors within a short period of time if it if it is a real event right then that's a period of elevated rates of evolution perfect for using the uh, molecular clock approaches that we've just we've just covered um, and so of course some of my very talented colleagues have looked at directly this question so the, the um, paper that I have put a reference to here on the bottom of this slide uses um, a molecular clock approach to study the rates of evolution during the origins of the arthropods as part of the Calambrian explosion. So these are the, this is the group that includes uh, arachnids and insects amongst other relatives. So by modelling um, the, uh, the the tree and then working out its probability and then coming up with the most probable one we can look at the length of branches as well and we can look at the amount of change that occurs um in our data set um along those branches if they're very very short that rate may be quite high and what these authors do is they build an analysis using both morphological and molecular data um, and they derive the most probable tree using a probabilistic approach and then they use that to map the rates of evolution. By doing so, they show that if we assume uh, an Ediacaran origin for arthropods, i.e. an origin in the period before the Cambrian, phenotypic evolution, that's the evolution of morphology, was four times faster during the Cambrian explosion than it has been since. And molecular evolution, the evolution of their DNA, was 5.5 times faster than it has been for the rest of the time period since the Cambrian. They showed that these rapid evolutionary rates were robust to assumptions about the precise age of the arthropod group that fed into this analysis, and that also these occur within the range demonstrated for normal evolutionary processes. So it means that this period was unusual in that these rates were very, uh, were unusually high. Um, but that is unusual because actually these high rates were occurring across many different lineages. 
So the, we do see isolated instances of high rates elsewhere in the animal tree of life after this Cambrian explosion, but at least within this clade, it looks like all branches had elevated evolution <clears throat> during the Cambrian explosion, and that right there is what makes it unusual. So that's pretty cool, right? This is telling us that the Cambrian explosion may well have been a real event. But wait, there's more. So going on to some really cutting edge stuff in a paper that came out in 2019, um, this <clears throat> is a really interesting study that I want to use to complete this picture of the Cambrian explosion. And this is a new paper that takes one thing a step further, takes these things one step further. These authors use a large data set of Cambrian trilobites, um, the most abundant and diverse group of organisms during this time. Obviously, by this point, you're, you're familiar with trilobites. They're arthropods as well. And they use probabilistic clock methods on morphology, so on the anatomy of these creatures, to suggest that the rates of evolution in the earliest trilobites are virtually identical to those throughout their Cambrian fossil history. Okay? So the rates throughout this entire group, once we have a fossil record, seem to be the same. And this suggests that the Cambrian explosion was not only a real thing, that was the last paper, but that the Cambrian explosion was over by the time the typical Cambrian, Cambrian fossil record commences, a 521 million years ago. So it looks like a modern style marine biosphere had rapidly emerged over a period of 20 million years during the latest Ediacaran and the earliest Cambrian period. And combined, these rate studies suggest that this period was a short period of elevated evolutionary rates. Knowing this may in turn help us tie down the, its causes and then the origin of animals. And so there's a summary of a lot of the data that we have regarding um, animal origins and timing in this particular um, image on the right here. So that's how we can use these trees to try and look at these events and better understand their true dynamics. And I think it's a really, really attractive example. So as I've already mentioned, people used to think that Evolution was this gradual process that happened slowly and it happened um, kind of in, you know, slowly and gradually. However, this all changed in 1972 with a piece of work by uh, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, which I want to finish this video by introducing. In general, We've already met the idea that evolution can proceed via um, anagenesis or cladogenesis. Anagenesis being a change along a lineage, cladogenesis being speciation within that lineage. So the lineage splitting into two rather than just changing as a whole. And that's a useful distinction that we may want to make. And I've shown it graphically here. Um, the reason I chose to explain it here rather than when I mentioned it first time is because I think this sums it up really nicely. Here you have one lineage changing gradually through time in terms of its morphology. Here you have one lineage splitting it into many others. And that's the fundamental difference between those two. But we can also then map to these styles of evolution gradual change or bursts of evolution. So we'll call this punctuated evolution. So in gradual evolution, we can get gradual changes in the lineage, but we can also get nice gradual changes in these lineages with cladogenic events, with splits in the lineage. But we can see that there could be an instance where you have what we would call stasis in a lineage. So um, little change along a lineage, but then sudden changes, and that could be both anagenetic so that's anagenesis, where you have one lineage just changing suddenly, but you don't get it giving birth to lots of species. Or you could have it um, with a cladogenic mode of evolution, with lots and lots of splits in our lineages. So in the fossil record, we tend to see cladogenesis. So if we focus on that, and we focus on cladogenesis on the right here, we can see there are two models. The first, where you have gradual change in cladogenesis, is a thing called phyletic gradualism. 
This is where evolution takes place in lineages and speciation is a side effect of that evolution. The bottom instance here is a thing that we can call punctuated equilibrium. Most change in morphology, for example, is associated with speciation events such as this one here. And the lineage otherwise shows little evolution between these time periods. So for most of its existence, a species will demonstrate stasis. And this is the idea that Eldridge and Gould published in 1972 that really, I, I think, um, made everyone think again about the rates of evolution and view these things in a new light. They, Eldridge and Gould argued that the fossil record does not show evolution occurring in spe species lineages very commonly. Most species lineages show stasis, stasis over long periods of time. On the right is a classic example of this. Um, this is a, an organism, the horseshoe crab, that admittedly is not one species, but it seems to be relatively unchanged morphologically for about 400 million years, right? Um, so the, Eldridge and Gould took this observation and they, they shook up the world of paleontology and evolutionary biology by saying, hey, maybe we have stasis most of the time um, with punctuated um, bits, uh, periods where you have rapid change of morphology. The problem I th think with this is that it's really tricky to test. So it could be that what we see in the fossil record is an artifact of incomplete preservation within that fossil record. And this is what this um, diagram on the left hand side shows. It's an idea that was first seeded with Charles Darwin's observations of gaps in the fossil record. And what we could be having is we could be seeing um, little change building up in the preserved species duration, right? The bit of the species life that we're seeing in the fossil record may actually rely on just one or two sampled intervals. So in this instance, we may be having um, gradual evolution of single lineage, but when we can only sample it here and here, looking at that in a rock section, we would see instances of sudden change where in discontinuities or unconformities in our rock, say, where we see rapid change amongst that uh, along that time period, purely based on our sampling, not due to any underlying genuine pattern. So, Aldrin Gould foresaw this as a criticism, and they pointed out that to test punctuated equilibrium, you would need both abundant specimens, so lots of fossils, you would need fossils with living representatives that, species, that allow species to be identified clearly, clearly, you would need information on geographic variation because space could have an impact on this so that rapid speciation events, those are our punctuations, could be distinguished from migrations in or out of an area. So if, for example, we're only sampling one area, a migration into that area could look like a punctuation, but it wouldn't actually be. We would also need long continuous sequences of rocks without gaps with abundant fossils throughout and good dating to allow us to see this. And since they pointed this out, we've really struggled to hit this requirement. Sampling is generally not extensive enough. In even our best examples, and I've shown um, an image from one of these on the right that I actually took from a, a book by Benson and Harper, um, th there is enough room for questioning. So this example on the right is a study from um, uh, 1981 uh, by an author called Williamson that was based on hundreds and thousands of specimens of snails and bivalves in sediments deposited in the Lake Turkana area of Kenya from about 1.3 to about 4.5 million years ago. So really fantastic, top notch fossil sampling. We couldn't get any better because it's so recent and there's so much sedimentation. So that's, that's great. This is our ideal circumstance. The original paper suggested that stasis was common and rapid morphological shifts had taken place three times within the area. However, restudy of this same data set has argued strongly that the three apparent, apparent speciation shifts um, are actually invasion events. So our, our rapid shifts here could not represent punctuations, they could represent invasion events when flooding occurred and bivalves and gastropods from other areas entered our lakes and our rivers. And that being the case, that means that that wouldn't support the idea of punctuated equilibrium. So long story short, nice idea, kind of hard to test. More recent studies, as we've learned about with the Red Queen, 
show that evolution can happen on many levels. And overall, um, I think it's probably fair to say that we might expect both stasis and punctuated equilibrium to be consistent with adaptive evolution in the face of unstable environments, just at different evolutionary scales. So for example, at a small scale, we might expect a great deal of backwards and forwards movement, but that could average out to only moderate long-term change. So in this instance, that would mean that stasis does not mean no evolution. Rather, it means that a stasis could be a population that's constantly reacting to environmental shifts, but remaining the same species over millions of years. So it's just not changing uniformly in any direction. And it's an idea that's really quite attractive, right? Because that allows you to then think about these things um, as, as this constant, um, the only change is constant. And that we may then expect to see punctuated patterns and um, stasis patterns arriving from that one situation over different timescales, over different geographic scales. And it's a really cool idea. So we could see differences in those between these trends that I've mentioned based on both the environment and the group of organisms associated with, for example, their mode of life. For example, we may expect microfossil groups such as the single cell foraminifera. This is a group that some of you may have learned about in um, microfossils in the sedimentary rocks and fossil course, but if not, they're single celled organisms that have these really cool um, shells or tests as they're called. Um, and these creatures commonly show gradual patterns of evolution and they show sympatric speciation. Yeah, so speciation in the same kind of within the same region. So often this is within um, either a kind of a marine environment where things are not changing relatively quickly, especially within planktonic, we think, forms. In contrast, we might expect that species in sexually reproducing um, organisms that live in ever-changing environments where barriers may be established, such as the marine invertebrates that show on the left here, on continental shelves, say, or in many groups of plants and animals on land, we may expect to see punctuation more commonly with allopatric speciation related to those barriers. So we've got this interesting idea building up that's um, expounded in it further in this paper here um, that you can read if you so wish, that we get, can get both punctuated equilibrium and phyletic gradualism. And when we see that the balance between those two end members is entirely reliant on the animals we're looking at and the environment in which they live. So I think that's, that's a pretty cool idea. And I'll leave you there. Um, and I will see you in video number four. See you in a sec.